When people think of Visa, they think of credit cards. But Visa is so much more than just a credit card company. It's a technology and innovation company that's making digital payments a reality for consumers, businesses, banks, and governments all around the world. At Visa, they have a simple and unwavering vision that can be traced back to their beginnings in 1958 to be the best way to pay and be paid for everyone, everywhere. They know that every Visa transaction is a promise. Whether you're at a food truck, outside the stadium, or paying your fantasy league dues online, Visa wants to provide you with the most secure and easy payment experience possible. All you have to figure out is, where would you like to be? Visa, everywhere you want to be. Hey y'all, Uncle Jimmy here. When you speak for yourself, you're forced to think for yourself. And when you think for yourself, the sports world looks different. In order to enjoy this podcast and this show, you need to have the courage to look at the world from alternative points of view and not be offended when you disagree. Speak for Yourself isn't your Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram feed. SFY tells you what you need to hear and not what you want to hear. So, welcome aboard, buckle up, and enjoy the ride. We start in Oakland. All right, today, I'd love to gloat. I'd love to come on here and say, I told you so. Mm. As I predicted yesterday, the Oakland Raiders beat the Los Angeles Chargers on Thursday night football. Derek Carr outplayed old man Phillip Rivers. I was right, but I was also wrong. The QB I called the best situation in the AFC West. The QB I said deserved a ton of credit for the Raiders' promising start. The QB I called an affordable luxury dream car looked like the guy who could keep John Gruden and the Raiders out of the playoffs. Steven Ruiz of USA Today, I apologize. Based on what we saw last night, you might have Derek Carr pegged right. Carr is getting too much credit for Oakland's success. Carr was an average quarterback last night. The Raiders beat the Chargers 26-24 because old man Rivers was Eli Manning awful. Rivers tossed five interceptions, bogus penalties erased two of them. A Raiders defense that has struggled to create turnovers and big plays scored a touchdown and sacked Rivers five times. Thursday's game should have been a Raiders romp. Carr wouldn't let it happen. He missed too many open receivers. He played like a young Andy Dalton. Mm. Yesterday, I said the Raiders have the best QB situation in the AFC West because Carr is locked into a reasonable contract. Today, I believe if the Raiders don't make the playoffs this year, it will be because the Raiders are locked into Derek Carr. The Raiders are a 5-4 and four and in the thick of the AFC West, AFC wild card race with Buffalo, Indianapolis, and Pittsburgh. Oakland has a favorable schedule facing the Bengals and the Jets in the next two weeks. At the moment, the Chiefs are the lone team left on Oakland's schedule with a winning record. John Gruden has done an amazing job with his football team. He's clearly turned the Antonio Brown saga into a motivational edge for himself, his players, and the Oakland fan base. I ridiculed the Raiders for paying him $100 million. Watching him celebrate last night with Raiders fans in the black hole in the team's final season in Oakland, (laughs) <laughs> Who can argue he's not worth every penny? Derek Carr, on the other hand, I turned off my TV worried he's going to cost the Raiders a playoff spot. All right, joining the desk now are Fox Sports NFL analyst Eric Mangini and LeVar Arrington. Marcellus, I'll start with you. Yeah. Confident Derek Carr will lead the Raiders to the playoffs? No, not confident at all. Derek Carr is going to do what Derek Carr does. And the Oakland Raiders are going to do what the Oakland Raiders do, which is not make the playoffs. That's not what they do. They've made it once in Derek Carr's tenure, and he wasn't even there for that outing. Um, Derek Carr being a franchise quarterback is a question that obviously is difficult to answer. I don't know any other franchise quarterback that runs through coaches like Derek Carr has. He's on his fourth coach in his sixth year. And of these six years, four of them of record are losing seasons. One was not, and we don't know what this year is going to turn out to be. So even if they make the playoffs, hypothetically, does it matter? Like, I mean, it's destruction or introduction. Hello? Yes, AFC team right here. Yeah, uh, 53 limos. We need 53 limos. (laughs) To the Oakland Hotel. Josh Jacobs, you need a, a limo? No, I'm just, hey, look, he on a team. He wearing silver <laughs> black. He gets a limo, too, even though he doesn't deserve it. Yeah. I just look at it like you are a team that caused three turnovers. You went at home by two to a four and five team? Just listen to that equation. Doesn't sound like that team is devastating. Even if they limp to the playoffs, I don't think they're going to make much noise. Mm. Yeah, that, last night was a, a bit of an aberration. This is a team that had four interceptions in eight games. 
and got three yesterday. And you could argue they got five yesterday. However, however you want to look at the penalties. And it's a, it's a team that's, I think, 27th in points allowed, 28th in, in yards allowed. They're struggling defensively. They've got problems on the defensive line in terms of depth. They lost two more DBs. So if he is going to allow them to make the playoffs, he's not only going to have to play really well for him, but he's also going to have to overcome the challenges that the, this defense presents. And, and they're going to have to score a lot of points on, on a consistent basis. He, he was in the running for, for the MVP at one point in his career, and he's shown that potential. And I do think the second year in an offensive system is the difference between understanding what you have to do and understanding why you do it. And, and mm. you're seeing some of that growth as you go through the course of this season. I like that. Yeah, I think this was a, a team that has, has struggled. And the answer is no, not confident that he leads them to, to the playoffs. But – can he manage them to the playoffs? You look at some of these other teams that are in the hunt, uh, the Steelers, the Jaguars, the Titans. Then you look at, okay, is it the Bills and the Colts that, that may, may or not finish out in a way that gives the opportunity for a Raiders team to, to slip in there? I think it's not about him leading them. I think it's more about him managing it. I think maybe that's what you're alluding to a little bit, knowing what your capabilities are. He has the ability to make big plays. He has the ability to be uh, a quarterback that could be the guys, the reason why you win. But I think right now they run the ball, they play defense, and as long as he manages the games, they have a chance of winning enough games to get <clears throat> to the playoffs. Well, look, their defense scored a touchdown last night. They jumped out to a 10-0 lead. I think they had the ball up 10-0. And Derek Carr uh, overthrew some guys and a three and out that allowed San Diego or Los Angeles Chargers to get back in the game. I just wasn't impressed with Derek Carr. And then I looked up and 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 I was just shocked at how many uh, mental errors the Raiders made. Defensive linemen three times couldn't line up on side mm. and got called for being in the neutral zone. Maybe it was question. Maybe it was ticky tack. The ref should have let it go. But, it, you know, it's just mind-blowing to me that that happened. I've never seen it. It happened all in the same quarter. Three, and so the Raiders were a bit sloppy. It, it, they had a chance to really have uh, Thursday night all to themselves, an impressive showing. They kind of butchered it. I'm sure John Gruden doesn't care. He's 5-4. and four. Right. He's celebrating with his fan base. I get it. They're ahead of schedule to some degree. Even with this schedule, though, I'm not confident that they complete the deal. They should win the next two weeks. But if you're going to be sloppy, you can't line up right, you're going to have all those penalties that they had. And, again, some of the penalties were bogus. I don't know what these refs are doing. But if, and if Derek Carr is not going to be sh uh, sharp, they're going to – because, again, Pittsburgh, Buffalo, uh, Indianapolis, I, I, they're going to jack up this opportunity to make the playoffs as a wild card. Yeah, I, just this team coming in, uh, I know a lot of people were making notice of their travel schedule, which obviously hindered them in early parts of the season. But if you look at their wins, Denver, Colts, Bears, Lions, like no team that we can all declare definitively that's a good team. Just teams on the bubble. Agreed. Uh, and the Chargers – is a good team that doesn't know how to play well and doesn't know how good they are. So I don't see the signature win and I don't see the signature performance to give me confidence about this team postseason. Well, it's also, we're, we're talking about the Chargers, and this is a team that just has, has a new offensive coordinator. It's only his second game on a short week. The quarterback played about as, as bad as you can, and I don't know how you can say this team is ahead of schedule. Jack Del Rio won 18 games in his two years there and went to the playoffs. They're not going to win a total of 18 games over two years, and we don't know if he's going to go to the playoffs. Mm. So I don't know how you say this. You this, expect him to be five and four. This, for me, they I was fired a guy who won 18 games, mm. who went to the playoffs, mm. and you replace him, and you're going to win less games over that same time period and not go to the playoffs. I don't know how you – look, I'd love for you to, to fill out my personnel evaluation. <laughs> and and you know, I don't know what you think Matt LaFleur is worth. He must be worth $200 million. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's one of those things where and, – and I'm not mad at big contracts. I love big coaching contracts. I think they're fantastic. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you know, to say that they're ahead of schedule, I don't even think John would even agree with that. Okay, mm -hmm. hold on. Because you've moved us you've into moved the us next there. topic. Is, has he proven he's worth $100 million? I'm leaning, yes, because, again, and these are based off my expectations. I came into this season 
laughing at John uh, Gruden. And when the A-B thing happened, I was laughing out loud and thought this was a dumpster fire headed off the rails. I don't think I was alone in that. Lewis Riddick over at ESPN is one of the few guys that I've heard consistently say, this is going to be a good football team. And so far at five and four, and we're focused on the negative of Derek Carr. I do have to tip my hat to their offensive line. Uh, Joey Bosa, what, he, he, they put him in witness protection last night. Mm. That was a great job by their – so there mm. are some things. Yeah, I contend they're ahead of schedule at 5-4 and four this season based off my expectations. You know what? Those are reset expectations. And uh, Look, you move the goalpost or you move the starting line, the race is going to look different to Coach's point of Jack Del Rio. And let's talk about the coaching carousel and why I think he is worth the $100 million. It's not just because he's a coach. It's because he's a brand. Think about all the coaches that came before Gruden. And I play for Jack Del Rio, who I have tremendous respect for. Tony Sperano, Dennis Allen, Hugh Jackson, Tom Cable, Lane Kiffin. What's the commonality in all those? Not one of those coaches are coaching right now as a head coach. Mm. Whatever's going on in this organization, whatever's going on with Derek Carr, it is a coach killer. And to the point, not, not just in your locale as being the Oakland Raiders head coach, but you won't be coaching somewhere else in the near future. So what do you bring in? Someone who can withstand that pressure, that turmoil. Even if they don't give the same level of success, they give you a greater level of stability. And that's what he's done. He's actually infused this organization that was in flux, that is in transition to a place where now you can't look at the coach and say, I'm going to X him out. So now we have to look at the personnel, and he's hitting on his draft choices. The last two games, six scrimmage touchdowns were scored by four different rookies, all of their touchdowns. We saw last night on defense two rookies combined for 15 pressures and three sacks. They're starting to hit. Those young players are starting to blossom, and that's the formula that they're buying into mm. the long game. Well, when you talk about him having to withstand the, the pressures, it's, it's not about him withstanding it. It's about ownership withstanding it. And, and the reason that organizations have so much turnover is because ownership can't stomach the turbulence that goes with changing an organization. And I give Mark Davis credit. He believed in what he believed in. He was willing to make a big commitment to it. And, and, and we'll see how it goes. And, and from a brand perspective, Al Davis is one of the most respected, was one of the most respected men in, in the history of football. And he traded John Gruden. So, like, I think you got to just kind of put it in perspective. But at the end of the day, the people that need to be sound or the person that needs to be sound and committed is ownership. Well, that John Gruden is not this John Gruden. Let's just be real about how the broadcasting, the quarterback camp, whatever it is, the whole Chucky persona took on a life of his own once he left Oakland. Because when I played against him in Oakland, he was John Gruden, the coach. And then he left, and then, as we all, my career is greater up here in a suit than it was when I was actually leaving the game because people start to res respect what you did in totality. He wins the Super Bowl. He becomes this, uh, this big-time broadcaster. I think he comes in with a different perspective and a different cachet than when he left. Yeah, I, I think he's worth the, the $100 million contract, and, and I think a lot of it has to do with – the broadcasting side of it. You're going to have to, to put something out there that was enticing enough for him to leave the stability of what he had already, you know, established. That's one, that there's that added value. Uh, I think the second thing you got to take into consideration is the fan base and how popular this franchise is and being, being able to, what we say, withstand what's taking place and what is. It is a rebuild that's going on in Oakland right, right now, and that, that's, there's no way around that. Um, for as good as uh, Coach Del Rio may have done when he was there, since, since his departure, it has been a team in flux. So he, has, he seemingly has put some stability in place. One point that was not made is we're talking about can they make it to the playoffs. They're only one game away from the team that's they're leading. The, 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 but <laughs> they're only one team away from that. One win so. away. But, but, but listen, mm -mm. Eric, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I think if Mark Davis is sitting there saying, why did I spend $100 million on John Gruden? Hmm. Because I'm transitioning this franchise to Las Vegas. How do I get out of Oakland without it being a disaster the last couple years? And again, when I looked at that last night, him celebrating in the black hole with that fan base, and they're having a great moment, Value. their last nationally televised game probably at that Coliseum or, you know, solo uh, nationally televised game. 
And so I just feel like Mark Davis is sitting there going, this is what I paid for. Yeah. We're leaving Oakland on a high note, despite trading Khalil Mack, despite what happened with Antonio Brown, yeah, you... despite Br – this is ending on a high note, and we're going to run off to Las Vegas with – Maybe they go eight and eight, seven and nine, but they're going to be optimistic going into next season, their first year in Las Vegas. Hey guys, this is Jason Whitlock from Speak for Yourself. Are you ready for what's ahead? You can't always predict the future, but you can game plan for it. Generations of families and businesses have harnessed the power of Pacific to help them reach their unique goals. Whether you need to save enough money to meet your needs, ensure your family is protected, or make sure you don't run out of money, Pacific Life has a variety of financial solutions that can help. Pacific Life counts more than half of the 100 largest U.S. companies as its clients and has been named one of the 2019 world's most ethical companies by the Ethisphere Institute. Protecting what matters most to people for 150 years and counting, that's the power of Pacific. Ask a financial professional about how Pacific Life can help you game plan for the future or visit PacificLife.com. Fox Sports salutes Veterans Day. <sighs> Speak for yourself, presented by Hyundai. Yeah. Whitlock and Wally, LeVar Arrington is back. We're joined now by Fox NFL analyst TJ Hoosman's out of time now for a big story. Let's move to Phillip Rivers, who threw away the Chargers' chances for a win last night, tossing three interceptions. Give me that. Including a pick six and having two more interceptions wiped out by Raiders' penalties. There's been a lot of speculation that Rivers' run with the Chargers is ending, and one name that keeps popping up as a replacement, possibly, is Cam Newton, who is likely done in Carolina. Needless to say, Rivers look like he's overstayed his welcome. With the quarterback suffering the most losses since 2015, with the second most interceptions and giveaways in that same period, I think Cam Newton makes a lot of sense for the Los Angeles Chargers in terms of box office and in terms mm. of potential play mm. on the field. A 30, 31-year-old Cam Newton in Los Angeles, I think, could sell tickets and <clears throat> give them some hope of better quarterback play. Mm. So that's your exit strategy right there, huh? Cam? Get, yeah, yeah. Get rid of an older declining quarterback to get another old declining quarterback. Oh, He's 30. 31 when he gets yeah. on that field next time. Just stop trying to, <laughs> trying to cut them numbers. <laughs> oh, that boy getting old, and we don't know what he is. Once again, I love Cam Newton. Once again, we have to look at the numbers. Cam Newton in his last eight ball games, you would think that Cam Newton has won at least one of them, and he has not. Cam Newton, by the numbers in terms of completion percentage, yards and attempt, uh, he has thrown more interceptions than touchdowns, and his passer rating is 81. You could say he was hurt through all of that, but the conversation then goes to, who is he post-injury? We always want to say, before the injury, he was an MVP candidate. Can someone declare who you are post-injury? Since we don't know that, I don't think this would be a good transition. And don't forget where he would land if he were an L.A. Charger. This is a third-generational family foundation organization. They treat their own like family, even though they will get rid of a player. LT, we all get it. Some of the greats. Phillip Rivers has not hit that threshold where then he doesn't get to borrow in on some of his equity. He's going to have a greater, softer exit strategy than displacing him with Cam Newton, who you have question marks about. Oh, man, if, if you base it off of last night, 100% he'll be an upgrade. <laughs> with, with the technology of today, Cam Newton's going to be healthy when he plays. The next time we see Cam Newton on the field he will look like the Cam Newton that was an MVP candidate. Oh, you believe that? When you pretty much take an entire year off, you're going to come back ready to go. That's number one. Mm. The Number two is look at the NFL now. Mm -hmm. there, there are very few non-mobile quarterbacks. Yeah. Phillip Rivers is one of them. He can't move. You put pressure on Phillip Rivers, it's a sack or it's a pick. Yeah. Raiders had five picks uh, in, uh, sacks last night. And you, you take away the, yeah. the penalties for just lining up offsides, there's more picks there. Mm. You look, if they, if they don't address the offensive line, they have no choice but to move on from Phillip Rivers because he, he's a statue back there. He can't move. And he will be an unrestricted free agent after this year. What are they going to pay Phillip Rivers, $30 million, Or you trade for Cam Newton and pay him twenty? million? Mm. Well, I, well, since you looked at me with that pause, uh, let's just talk about it. <laughs> I didn't know where he was coming back. One, every big man in every sport, every doctor would tell you 
the greatest mm -hmm. indicator of them declining is something happening to their feet. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go any sport, when the a Liz Frank injury where you are not getting surgery, we're going to rehab it, and then the prognosis changes by the week is scary. Two, it's not fair to look at Phillip Rivers in this game. In totality, I understand it since 2015, but this game, two backup offensive tackles. Yeah. They were sacking him as soon as they said hut because they were with the reserves. So Phillip Rivers, let's not forget who he was last year, leading his team to the playoffs. I just think it's a little too short-term, short-sighted to just but say if you, move. But if you, you look at it, what is what are you paying Phillip Rivers next year? He's unrestricted. Yeah. He's unrestricted. You're going to give him that. $30 million? Great point. Let him go. Oh! Uh -oh. <laughs> what? I mean, he is a Hall of Famer for... For who? For the San Diego NC Chargers. State. He's a Hall of Famer. I think he's a Hall of Didn't Famer. Didn't he play at NC State? Yes, he no, I, think, yeah. I think he's going to be a Hall of Famer. He'd be yeah. up for, for, for the Chargers? Yes, I think oh, he's at no, a I think he's at gold yeah, jacket. I think he's had a gold jacket career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't I don't think it will Why? I don't I think his performances over the years will warrant that. Um, if you look at it, if you go through a go stat ahead. line. Go ahead. Yeah, I appreciate it. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> not a Hall of Famer. I, I, I love Philip Rivers. Maybe debatable. Go ahead. Judy and Edelman in there. Go ahead. It's debatable. Anyways, so when you look at it, if if Cam is healthy, is that is is he an upgrade? Yeah. Just purely from the player's standpoint, he probably is an upgrade in terms of from the health standpoint of it. Uh, but how long can he stay healthy? Man, that that would be my biggest question, and that would be the biggest detracting uh, factor in terms of if you're gonna if you're gonna bring him in. The second determining factor would be the leadership aspect of it. You, you'd have to believe that by now, Philip Rivers his leadership role, if he is indeed being brought back or looked at to be brought back at, at a reasonable price, uh, do you really want to replace mm -hmm. the leadership value? And keep in mind, he did have great success the year before. Right. So this season isn't over yet. It hasn't concluded. We don't know what the end result is. But do you look at what he was able to do his body of work last season and say, okay, we, we get rid of that based off of this season, bring in a guy that we didn't feel is good enough to even bring back in Carolina to be the starter with a guy that isn't Lamar. even considered a franchise Lamar. quarterback. They got a new stadium. Ooh. They already are struggling building a brand here in Los Angeles. Eh. Ownership is a... We ain't going to London. Damn right. <laughs> so they need some box office. And whether we like it or not, Cam would be great box office. People would go out on a Sunday, hey, let's see what Cam's going to do. For how long? Well, for how long? How, long for how enough long to sell that... some season tickets, three or four games, and if it goes longer than that, great. But where are you basing that off of? Yeah, yeah. He yeah. hasn't played. Where one, are you basing one, it off of? Put your money where your mouth is. And just last night, I went and bought my four season tickets to the LA Chargers new stadium. Oh, you guys should go out there and do the same damn thing. And I'm gonna tell <laughs> nice you why. Nice I play. did that with the mindset of I'm going to see Phillip Rivers, a franchise quarterback, a winning quarterback. Former teammate. No, I wasn't there. There, you know, I was a cap casualty. They couldn't afford <laughs> both of us. <laughs> Swan, <laughs> Swan song. But but knowing that I have that stability in Safe. place. This is a guy who is six all-time in yards, six all-time in touchdown passes, and just before last night was leading the NFL in yards per game. So what are we... Nobody's saying... I, I, at least I'm okay, not saying let's get this right. Rivers can't play. Okay, not, let's get this right. Boys, yeah. You have to look... He's unrestricted. So now like that point. we got to spend money and beef up this offensive line. So now we got to bring in better linemen Damn. to protect him and... You mean the we starters have to, to play? <laughs> and we won 12, 12 games around. last year, Rock man. Sports. 12 games. It's proud affordable. to partner with the Mission oh. Continues, a nonprofit organization deploying military veterans and community leaders to build stronger communities across the nation. Visit www.missioncontinues.org to learn more. Let's I'm move glad to college football. Where a surprising name just popped up in the Florida State search yep. for a new head coach with our own Jay Glazer confirming <laughs> other reports that Hall of Famer Deion Sanders has emerged as a candidate to replace the recently fired Willie Taggart. There is no doubt that primetime is one of the greatest players in FSU history. Mm. He has no real coaching experience to speak of. All right, the question here is, think Deion Sanders could succeed at Florida State? Oh, absolutely. Um... Not just FSU history, football history. I mean, Deion Sanders. Let's head put our... Uh, hmm? You think he could see it as a head coach? Yeah, CEO head coach, which is a little different, and I'm not certain of the details of Herm Edwards, but I was there in the beginning, 
And Herm Edwards, who has former coaching experience, obviously, which is a great separation between him and Dion, but in a position where you hire a tremendous staff, as Herm has done, at a 5-3 and three Arizona State uh, situation and team that's turned itself around, and then you employ them, but then you become that brand. Imagine 18-year-old mindset Jason Whitlock sitting there getting recruiting letters, and then someone rings the doorbell, probably knocks because y'all were broke. They had no door. <laughs> That's true. Hey, That's true. Jason in there? It's prime time. Huh? How many pens can you give me to sign right now? Like, just, just go ink it out, and I'll tell you why. The relatability, the ability to cut through, and the ability to talk it and walk it. When you have a coach like that, if he employs the proper people that can dive deeper into the X's and O's, which I know Dion knows, but can he translate that and convey that and also delegate that is the conversation. But in terms of in inspiring a fan base and inspiring prospects, hell yeah, Dion could work. Her, I don't think that comparison to Herm is, is fair at all. Herm worked his way up. He, he played, he served a lot of different roles to get to a head coaching position. He's a head coach at two different places. He, he's done a lot of things, both in college football and pro football, before going back to, sure. to this opportunity. And look, this would be a really interesting experiment. The, the grind in coaching is real, and it's nonstop, and it's every day. And recruiting, as much as the, the visits to the home are one aspect of it. It's identifying the players, the right players. It's, it's, it's taking their call night or day when they call. It's, it's a, such a different situation than anything he's experienced before. You are right. He would need a, a unbelievable support staff mm. to make that work in, in any capacity. I feel like I'm the most qualified to speak on, on this Prime situation. I spent a lot of time with, with Prime. A lot of years, we, we did the Under Armour All-American game. The, the amount of winning that he is able to do right now at Texas uh, Trinity High School, where he's at right now, although different in terms of level and the amount of money, because I know people brought up the fact that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, his, his prime, prime, prime prep, prep uh, failed. The amount of money and the amount of support that he would receive at FSU would be unparalleled, mm. unparalleled. Mm -hmm. Some of the most important aspects of being a college coach is being able to build a staff. He can check that box off. As you mentioned, recruiting, he can check that box off. And in, in fact, not only can he check the box off to be able to recruit, but he knows most of these high profile players by name because of what has taken place with him establishing the camps that he's been doing for years his prime 21 camp mm. he has had the most elite players for probably the last 10 years so he knows all these kids by name if you can get the type of talent he gets them to his high school if you could get the type of talent that Dion can bring and the type of funding that Dion can bring mm. and you can put together the staff that Dion can bring you are now opening up Pandora's box to a lot of guys that have been in the coaching industry that have flown under the radar like a Deion Sanders and are quietly paying their dues and can really coach. I played with Deion. Deion is one of the best football minds that I have ever been around. People may think it was his athletic ability that made him special. No, it's his work ethic that made him special. The amount of detail that he paid, paid attention to knowing he was such a student of the game. So to put Deion Sanders in a place where he would be the mayor, he's already the mayor of Tallahassee anyway. Mm. So now you bring Deion in, I can guarantee you, close behind is a guy like P-Dub, Peter Work. Here he comes, getting, getting receivers. One of the greatest college football players that I've ever seen with my own two eyes. You, he would give people hell on the recruiting tour. He would be perfect for the position. Here's what mm. I, I, I'm – Huge Deion Sanders fan. Here it comes. Uh, yeah, here it comes. It, it's just, <laughs> man, being a head coach is one of the most boring jobs in the world. Yeah, never lied. And <laughs> success is just so boring. It, 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 in these high pressure leadership positions, it's really boring. Deion likes excitement. Deion likes being on TV. Deion likes being a celebrity. And if you go look at the coaches that work, I'm, Nick Saban is a very boring person. 
Bill Belichick, a very boring person. The routine of day after day coming in and doing the exact same thing. And what a coach does, mostly, is repeat the same message in a different fashion every day. He's only really got one or two messages, mm. and he just keeps coming up with a new way to say the same thing over and over and over again and do the same thing over and over again. It's a boring job. Dion doesn't fit the personality of a head coach. Mm. Everybody does it have to be boring? Well, and it doesn't. because well, That's I, what I'm, I'm saying. Why is it a hundred years James of experience. Franklin, James Franklin yeah. makes coaching fun. Herm Edwards, he makes head coaching fun. Yeah. That's why the kids are gravitating to those programs. Yeah. But, you yeah. can make it fun and still your personality is boring. Again, That's true. So that I'm is true. Not, there's a, just a routine of monotony to being a head coach or being successful, period. And everybody thinks fun is the ingredient that drives the whole thing. If you can just make it fun. You know what's fun? Consistency. Well, he didn't highlight you know, fun. You he know, highlight electricity. The juice electric, he would give that program. It's, it's, I don't think electricity does Let me tell you it. something. The, oh, it's, really? It becomes his kingdom. And that's what's going to be exciting for Dion. Now, here's where it could brutally go wrong. Mm. Is if he isn't successful and he isn't successful for an extended amount of time. Then you find out that being Dion and being prime may have been better on the field than it was being a coach at FSU. They only gave the last head coach, what, a year and a little bit? Yeah. So it, the turnaround's going to have to come very quickly if, if that's the timeline that they've set for success. And look, Nick Saban's not fun, but Nick Saban wins, and he wins on a, consi a consistent basis. And, and it, the grind of it, to me, is, is where there could be some issue because it doesn't stop. And college football is very different than pro football because you've got a lot of, of different bosses. You've got a lot of different go areas that you constantly hit. Yes, yeah, it's fundraising, it's speak engagements, oh. it's recruiting, it's football, it's all those things. And, and you've got 110 kids but that, I, you've I got, just, that you've got to manage. I'm cannot. just telling you, the best coaches and a lot of times the best leaders – they don't go from celebrity and then transition into leadership. The celebrity actually is a burden for leadership. Now, has Nick Saban become a celebrity? Yes. But he worked his way up and did all the monotonous stuff that it takes to be a coach, and then his success as a coach made him a celebrity. Dion loves... I'm not knocking him at all. He loves the attention. He loves being Dion. He loves a lot of things... That came from the work that Dion put in to no get No question that about it. So he could put it in the but work he's here. Still, but he's still no. put... But I think we're underestimating how much preparation and how much right. time he has been putting in. I mean, he is connected to so many... And I don't want to go too deep because I don't even yep. want to expose him um, in terms of anything that could be misinterpreted in terms of people he knows. But the kids... He knows the kids, hmm. the, the coaches. He knows the coaches. And if you can fundraise, which he would be able to fundraise, if he's going to have the support. Money don't of, fix problems. No, but, but kids, but, but talent and develop, right. Development. So, it's all about development. He would be and able to bring in those type of coaches. development is very boring. It's them 6 a.m. weightlifting deals that you He ain't going to be there at 6 a.m. I'm about to say, my coach wasn't at no 6 a.m. He ain't going to be there. He's going to put together. The, you got a partnership with the coaches together. I got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, if, it, if you could delegate it all away, trust me, Nick Saban would be here while coaching Alabama. Cowboys host the Vikings at Jerry World Sunday night. Mm. The game is a showdown of two quarterbacks, Dak Prescott and Kirk Cousins, who are trying to prove their doubters wrong. Both of these guys are having solid seasons and have similar numbers, with Kurt trying to earn the big contract Minnesota gave him, while Dak is trying to convince Jerry Jones he deserves a new deal. Got to ask you guys, who, who would you go with? <laughs> Cousins or Dak? <laughs> uh, look, I'm all about the money. Uh, <laughs> Kirk Cousins is signed to a now reasonable contract of $28 million a year. I'm going with Kirk Cousins. Dak Prescott wants $35, $40 million a year. I got to go with the guy at a more affordable price, mm. Kirk Cousins. Get what you pay for. That's what mama used to say. <laughs> <laughs> Baby. <laughs> you should pay for a little more because if you pay down, you're going to be right back in this situation unhappy with your results. Kirk Cousins, 5-25 versus teams with winning records. Lord. Uh, Dak Prescott, second most wins since he's been in the league. Hmm. I'm paying for that guy, and I want to get maximum value, and I might have to pay maximum price. But Dak Prescott's a winner, and he has the moxie. Don't forget who he was. He came in and took over for Tony Romo, who was basically doing it all for this franchise, a franchise quarterback. 
Teflon to a degree. And then this guy comes in and inserts himself in his performance and his leadership and stabilizes this franchise? Oh, it's not even close. It's Dak Prescott. When, when you look at the two and, and, and every number across the board, Dak leads over Kirk. So that, that's one component of it. You know, this year he makes 7% of what Kirk Cousins is going to make. But, and, and I know we're talking about the next contract. <laughs> but in looking at that next contract, it's not just about the player. It's about the, the human being. And mm. the people that I know in Dallas can't say enough good things about him. And, and, and these are, are friends and people that I trust who would tell the truth. And they talk about the, his, his relationship with the other players, his work ethic, his drive, his consistency, the way that he's able to, to balance things out. And to me, that gives him a chance to continue to get better. And, and that's what you're looking for. I think that the issue with Kirk is he was essentially let go by Washington. They, they let him walk into free agency. And, and there were reportedly issues there. And there's been some discontent in, in Minnesota as well. So you wonder where that's all going to play out. And then there's a the question of how – how well does he perform in big games? And, and that hasn't been answered, even though the contract question for him has been answered. Uh, to answer your question, I'm taking Dakota Prescott. Mm. That is no, no question about it. And you, you bring up the money a lot, but when Kirk Cousins signed this contract, he was at the head of the class. When? When, when he, key And so when Dak signs his contract, he'll be somewhere towards the top, and then he'll fall somewhere in the middle. That's yeah. just how it works. Right. When you... You pay your quarterbacks to win and lead, in my opinion. And Dak Prescott, he's winning games, and he leads the team. When you're a player on that team, if you don't like the quarterback, there's all he does anything wrong, it's going to be a problem. You're going to go to your position group and other guys on the team, and you're going to talk about them. Mm. You, you're going to talk about them. But he's the quarterback, so you kind of got to be careful. But when you become a player that the coach can't do anything to, now you're going to talk to the quarterback. Mm. And that's going to be a problem. And if Dak Prescott, like Coach said, has a locker room, guys gravitate towards him, they'll always, whether he plays good or bad, they'll always have his back. And that goes a long way to keeping a team stable and having them functioning the right way. It's when a quarterback is making as little money as Dak and providing that kind of value, they're always popular in the locker room. It's when they get paid is when people start coming out how they really feel. Donovan McNabb went through this mm. in Philadelphia, and T.O. and some guys undercut him. Uh, things got worse, in my view, for Russell Wilson in Seattle once he started making some money. Dak's a value pack right now, and everybody loves him. <laughs> I, I get it. it it's, it's awesome. But he's about to get paid, and... I, get, I, I understand that Kirk Cousins is going through some turbulence there in, in Minnesota, and I get the receivers have taken some shots at him or, or, or whatever, and Stephon Diggs damn near won it out of there. I get, and Because I'm not. I was always against paying Kirk Cousins in Washington. I'm very consistent. Don't overpay these guys that aren't mm. superstars. And so I just think, for me, Kirk Cousins at $28 million right now, a better value than Dak Prescott at $35, $40 million next season. But, but yeah. to TJ's point, it's, it's not a fair comparison. You're looking at one guy who's in the middle of his deal, and you're looking at another guy who's Life going is to Life isn't fair, Eric. No, no, I'm not saying, it, I'm not saying it's, it's, not, it's unfair that way. I'm saying that your, your evaluation is skewed completely wrong. Yeah. Because you can't look at a guy in the middle of a deal yeah. and equate it to a guy who's, who's going to hit free agency. It's not it's Apple. Not Apple. Or, it's not Apple. I'll, I'll, Apple. I'll, I'll, I'll say this, Eric. If Eric. you had come up with the question, you're right. <laughs> but since I did, <laughs> we're going to deal oh, with the fact. A flawed that question. He's <laughs> we, we <see. laughs> the well, question is, well, this guy's about to get paid a bunch of money. Well, I, I'm going to go, go with the question of right now. He makes 7% of what Kirk Cousins makes. Hello. So as What's going to happen Sunday bargain, night? Who's going to play a, better Sunday night? You already know. I think we do? Who would you bet on? Yeah, what's the... I'm betting on the Vikings. What's the grow you now? Yes, I am! Come on! Yes! Uh-oh, So you're go. going to play here those go. odds in his record I've in primetime game? I've been saying it all week. Dude. I've been saying it all week. Yes, Minnesota's going to put it on Dallas. We've been on Dallas. a roll lately with our picks together, but this one we got to disagree on. Y'all hit two picks out of 237,000 <laughs> picks, and y'all on a roll? The last two, and y'all on the roll right now. I'm just... I, hey, look, you remind me of my grandma when we used to go to church. And my grandma used to always tell me, baby, the love of money 
is the, is the root of all evil. And I was like, OK. And that's what it is in completion from the Bible. But then you get to church and somebody else walk up to you and say, oh, money is the root of all evil. And you're like, wait a minute. It's incomplete. You just said something that was incomplete. You said you get paid and it's a problem. That's not the problem in the locker room. When you get paid and you underperform, it's a problem. When has Dak Prescott ever underperformed? Let me tell you. I'm looking. I don't see it. He's a winning quarterback. Jets. 37 and... <laughs> oh, my Jets God. Okay. Okay. 37 and 19 versus 26 and 30. And Donovan McNabb was 30. balling and out. And Donovan McNabb was not a problem until they finally said, look, how many NFC championship games and one Super Bowl can we get to when you're making that much? Hey. So then it starts to become a problem because it's the underperformance of expectation. Do you think Dak is at Donovan McNabb's level? No, when I'm not okay. going there. Don't okay. do that. Well, but what, oh, wait a minute. Now, you... Two bad questions. He now, can what, get, what he can to, get to that and pass that. He really can. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my. A yes. win a Super Bowl uh, McNab- with a winning record? I'm just saying, are we going to compare McNabb's salary to no, no, what they're going to No, 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 no. You look I mean, at where Dak is at compared to McNabb. In his fourth year, he's still climbing. He's still climbing. He's climbing. This is his best he Dak can reach we've it. seen. Yes. Can you respect the intangibles, which is lending itself to him getting better Y'all put every me year? in a position of, like, I just think Dak's horrible. I don't. I just don't want to pay him $35 million, $28, $29 million, and we'd be having a totally different discussion. If they were paid equally... No, $28, $29 million (laughs) right there with Kirk Cousins. We would be having a different... I'll take that. Less than Carson Wentz? No, the same same as Kirk Cousins. They're the same guy. But he signed a contract three years years ago. I don't care. (laughs) 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 I'm not overpaying for my quarterback. I'm not. I want to be in the same situation as Tom Brady and the New England Patriots. Oh. I want to be, you know, until last night, Derek Carr and the Oakland Raiders. I, I, I want to, re- unless it's Patrick Mahomes or Aaron Rodgers, mm. I don't, or Russell Wilson or Deshaun Watson. Here we go. I don't want to be overpaid. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Tom Brady was the highest paid quarterback at one time. So at what, time, what, what were you saying it. then? He deserved it. He deserved he it. He won Super Bowl. He won Super Bowl last year. He deserved it as now. As Coach no? would say, that defense carried him initially, right? Early on. Yes. I mean, he yes. deserves Early on. He deserves yeah. all the money. Yeah, well, Blue, here's the other thing about Tom Brady. He does take less than market Blue Star values. Families builds True. communities that support military families by connecting research and data to programs and solutions, including career development tools, local community events for families, and caregiver support. With Blue Star Families, military families can find answers to their challenges anywhere they are. For more information, visit www.bluestarfam.org. Jason Whitlock, Marcellus Wiley, joined again by LeVar Arrington and T.J. Husmanzada. Let's get to the most fearless discussion of the day. A day after accusing the NFL of unfairness and racism and claiming he no longer wants to play professional football, unemployed diva wide receiver Antonio Brown backtracked, tweeting, I'm just very frustrated right now with the false allegations and slander to my name. I love football and I miss it. I just want to play and I'm very emotional about that. I'm determined to make my way back to the NFL ASAP. I'm not surprised Brown is emotional, and I'm sure some people believe his expression of that emotion is justified and healthy. I'm not one of those people. I believe Brown fits a pattern of male athletes who are increasingly ruled and controlled by their emotions. He's no different from Baker Mayfield and Odell Beckham Jr. It's my belief that the societal attack on masculinity, coupled with the enormous wealth now attained by professional athletes, has significantly changed the attitude, behavior, and identity of the modern athlete. In the name of progress, men and male athletes are being emasculated. I also believe the emasculation is most acute among black male athletes because the black father is absent in many homes. Baby mama culture has produced a culture where the highest level of blackness is victimhood. That's why LeBron James claims spray paint he never saw made him feel like Emmett Till's mother. That's why Colin Kaepernick chose martyrdom over playing football. That's why every weekend Odell Wines NFL rules mistreated him. That's why we act like Bill Polian suggesting that Lamar Jackson play receiver is akin to banishment to the CFL. We're on a constant hunt for victim status as a sign of our blackness. The mentality contradicts the culture of sports. It's unhealthy and undermines the success of any athlete who buys into it. All right, guys, I'm dropping a grenade on us. Has, uh, is that a grenade? <laughs> yes, it is. That's a bomb. Hi, Has pocket. emasculated victim mentality hurt black male athletes? No. Um, what we're seeing is an enlightenment. Um, and 
What we're seeing is evolution. What we're seeing is a culture that is now enticing, encouraging uh, people to really dig into different realms of expression that before we were told to suppress. So, as we know, the same things that warm you can be the same things that burn you. Let's talk about our people. Let's talk about our brothers. And I know I'm a walking example of someone who has post-traumatic stress demons. And what I've learned through my ride of 44 years on this planet is what worked then doesn't necessarily need to work now. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, probably won't work. And I'm learning this through therapy as I go every single week. And you're fine. Like your, your normalcy is your comfort. And as men, we've been told that if you keep it in here and you act this certain way, you'll be fine. But let's all register our secret private lowlights, those implosions, those triggers, those things that keep us at the edge. And what this culture has realized is let's get these brothers farther from that edge. Because if not, then the little things will become big things and blown out of proportion. And it doesn't have to be athletes. I'm just talking about the common man walking around who gets triggered to a different place because he's already in an inner turmoil because he has no expression. So I'm encouraged about this. As anything, when it's new, there's an overcorrection. So we're going to see people kind of go too far before they realize what's the true bullseye. And as I told you before, any marksman, when he wants to hit a bullseye, he doesn't aim at the bullseye. He aims off, he aims off, then pulls the trigger. This culture right now is off, it's off. You're sensitive, you're too emotional, you're complaining, boom. Then they'll finally nail it. We have to wait for that. Oh, man. A great response, but uh, yeah. go ahead. You know, I, it's interesting, and this has been an age old deal for me Growing up, I was the son of a school teacher, and she taught in Northview Heights. And if you're from Pittsburgh, you know that Northview Heights is one of the toughest areas that you could ever um, be in. We used to have to go into the communities to do parent-teacher conference. And it was interesting because I learned at an early age that, you know, having a dad and having the situation that I had, that there was a lot of elements out there that, that existed. And, and as it applies to this situation, there's just a, a lot of, and within my community, within the black community, there isn't that, that education, there isn't that constant reassurance of what you represent, the power that you represent. And it always bothered me. And, and, and just seeing how it's interesting, you feel so let down for so long. Mm. Everything is, you're being let down. I, I, I can't trust, and, and it's for so many different years. And I don't know if it's emasculated, victim but it certainly is victim it's you feel like a victim you feel like nothing can go your way and then for all these years you take that pain and you take that that letdown and you take all of those elements and you use it to propel you as an athlete you you go to a certain level you get to a certain place and it's always your mom that's there it's, it's your grandmom that was there your aunt your caretaker that was there for you for all those years and i think what we're figuring out now what we're seeing and why for me and, and even the segment with talking about dion being a coach why it would be important to have strong male figures especially strong black male figures in sports is because the more success i wrote this down the more success an athlete has the further they move away from the people that can relate and understand them, all right? So the more success that person has, they found all this success. They had all these good things happening to them on the football field. And, and you, when you mentioned LeBron, it happened on the basketball court. And then all of a sudden, here comes Nike. Here comes the NFL. Here comes the NBA. Here comes the agents. Here comes all of the money. And now all of a sudden we're looking at the fact that somebody who had used the pain to push them and propel them now in these type of circumstances that A.B. has found himself in now turns them into a victim. The same thing that made him a hero, the same thing that put him in a position to, to make the money that he makes and to have an agent and to have a beautiful house and a nice car and, and everything that comes along with the success. The one thing that has continued to be, be a disconnect and a divide is the development 
of them as human beings. And I think that that's the biggest problem that we're seeing right here. And when you look at the emasculated victim mentality, yes, it hurts us as, as, a, as a people. It hurts black people because in the end, if you don't understand that value and if you're not trained in order to be able to handle what comes along with that success, it's not just the success of being able to run around and catch right. the ball. It's, it's being able to be a person, a, a positive person. In, in relation to A.B., um, I know he grew up in Liberty City in Miami, and I don't know how involved his dad was in his life, but I've never met my dad. And when you grow up in the projects, and victim mentality is basically, I blame everybody for my problems. It's never my fault. It's always somebody else's fault. When you fight fire with fire, and so he's looking at the NFL like, oh, y'all not going to reinstate me? You not going to let me play football? All right, I'm going to send this tweet out. F the NFL. I don't want to play. He takes a step back. I really do want to play. Yeah. Hmm. And I'm going to put this out there. In relation to his accuser, it's more so, I've worked my tail off to get this money. I'm not about to be your come up. Like, you not about to come up off of me. Hmm. And that's how we think. You grow up. And how I grew up and where I come from, and I'm sure it's very similar situations. You shown a sign of weakness, you will get picked on every single day. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have his mentality growing up because you can't survive in that environment. You will get bullied and picked on every day. And so when you come at me, 100% I'm coming back at you. I'm not going to show you a sign of weakness at all because if I do, that will be attacked. And we all know that. And so he probably didn't have a male figure to tell him, it's okay to show signs of weakness, but you ain't going to be no punk. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's the biggest problem mm. is in our culture, in the way a lot of us have grown up, you show that it's the beginning of the end. And so he has to learn, it's okay to admit, I played a part in this. And let me see if I can correct this and try to rectify the situation. And once he does that, he will begin to move forward. I, I think one of the, everybody said some interesting things. The one thing where I'm critical of our culture, and I where I don't think this is this is being framed as progress. Show your emotions. Let your emotions go. I think we need to be trained how to handle, deal with, properly express our emotions. Sure. And that's what's been missing with a lot of these athletes that had no male role model, no father in their life. And I, I see it like, I just let me just be emotional. And em emotion is what gets me through a football game or through an athletic event, and it's going to serve me here showing my emotions. No. Properly channeling, properly dealing with your emotions, mm. that will get you through this in a healthier fashion. And I'm just... For me, as a man, I just look at a lot of where we're heading. It's just not masculine. It's just not the way I was brought up and raised by my father. And, and but I see that's the key, your father. And so, until this is a bigger problem, until our fathers are in the picture, who do we learn this from? And that's why I think who do having, you learn it I from? I think having the right figures coaching and being a part of their lives. At that, at that formidable stage is, is so important. Because what you're talking about, they're taking, we are taking our scars into a business environment. Hmm. We're taking our personal scars and our personal experiences into a business Here's environment. Here's what I also think, though, and again, this is going to be a bomb, but I just think we're shirking our responsibilities as men. See, because, again, we've turned being a man into complaining. Hmm. As a man... The way I was raised and the way I feel every day, my job is to fix problems, mm -hmm. not to, uh, solutions. <laughs> solutions. I'm here to mm -hmm. fix problems. My mama, girlfriend, wife, they can point them out. They come to, I'm the solution. That's and, learned. And again, right. That's and again, learned. my mother was a solution. Mm -hmm. Again, my parents got divorced and my mother was about solutions. So I'm not just saying it's just a man, woman thing. Anybody can be a solution solver, but we've come to this place now in our culture where we just think complaining and whining, that's, that's what we're supposed to do. I don't to disagree with that at all. I, I, th I don't disagree well, with we that. Well, we have to always remember at the primal level and in, in, in all cultures, all norms, all values, all beliefs, there's a choice. There's a selection. And even gender roles are choices that are morphing as generations uh, live. Let's talk about the men. 
Men walk out if they don't have a man in the home a lot of times with a fractured spirit. So what happens when you have a fractured spirit is an insecurity. And that insecurity may take you to a physical dominance. I can't show weakness. I got to put the Teflon on. But that's the problem. And I learned this at a young age that the bully strikes first because he's really scared to get punched. So he starts the fight because I don't really want you to bring me this fight. I start this out of pain just so that I can look like I am the more powerful one in this painful situation. Why are there so many gangbangers? Why did I grow up in a gang infested neighborhood? It's because nobody was at home to tell them I got you all the way around every piece of this puzzle. So when you have a two family dynamic, and this just happened to me this morning with my son, before I knew what we were gonna talk about this, I was listening to the dynamic between my, my son and his mother. And there was a lot of emotional energy going back and forth. And everything he said, she said, they went back and forth. And I was the bear, just letting them go back and forth. And finally, after the fourth exchange, it was like, hey. And then you know what? Everything was resolved. But we have to remember, when your ego is talking to you, it's irrational. When you're thinking cognitively, you're not empathetic. And when you're thinking emotionally, you're not logical. So we have to find the perfect translation of this. All of these things are going to take time. These brothers are walking out there who made it, That's and then their right. ego took them to a place where That's it said, right. I did this. Mm -hmm. That's not the same thing. So they're kind of out of text, out of zone. We'll see how That's they correct. Good, All right, Fox Sports is proud to partner with the Mission Continues, a, non a nonprofit organization deploying military veterans and community leaders to build stronger communities across the nation. Visit www.missioncontinues.org to learn more. Whitlock and Wiley, LeVar <laughs> Arrington's back. Let's move to New York. Man. Sponsored by Capital One, what's in your wallet? Oh. The Giants and Jets will battle for bragging rights Sunday. Oof. But the intra-city rivalry has put Saquon Barkley in an awkward position. His father is a lifelong Jets fan and will be at the game in a Joe Namath Jets jersey. Mm. Saquon says he's cool with it, and his dad gets his best of both worlds rooting for his favorite team and watching his son play in the NFL. All right, Saquon's dad in a Joe Namath jersey. Cool or nah? Cool, really cool. Especially being an athlete and how everything changes externally for you. The day you sign that contract and everyone says you change. And it's like, no, y'all change. The reception of me is different when I'm Saquon Barkley of the New York Giants. And it's refreshing to know that someone that you love like your dad is not blowing smoke up you. It's just like, <laughs> you know what, dog? I love you, I made you, but I'm still me. We have an interdependency. Means I have my own bucket of stuff. That is not Saquon. Saquon has his own bucket of stuff. That is not dad. And then we have our exchange. Respect for that man for being authentic and showing his son, I love you so much that I ain't got to kiss your butt. Uh, you see that Penn State. That Penn State don't change. We are, baby. <laughs> hey, but... but. <laughs> Here's a reality check, man. It's oh. F-O-E, not, not J-O-E, man. It's family <laughs> over everything. You can't put a J where the F goes, man. Oh, it ain't Jets funny. over everything. That's funny. It's family <laughs> over everything, man. Really? And the minute my child gets drafted, like Snoop made it, made it real, right? His son chose to go to UCLA. UCLA. He put away the USC gear and said, I'm a UCLA Bruin fan now because my child is a UCLA Bruin. If my kid ever is blessed enough to go play in the pros mm. and, and he goes and plays for the Cincinnati Bengals and I'm a lifelong Steelers fan, die hard, I'm putting away the Steelers gear and I'm all in with the Cincinnati Bengals until mm. he goes to the next team. And you know what? Mm. I'm going to be that until he's retired. Once he retired, I'm always had my childhood, my lifelong team for me. Mm, you got me there. I think I, some of that. I think they just have a unique, close, special relationship. Sure. That clearly Saquon's all good with a dad, keep it real. Right. You, know, you, you love the Jets. And, and look, you gotta, they ain't playing for nothing. Both teams are terrible. <laughs> if, if, this was, right. if this was for real, right. like the Super Bowl, if, yeah, or yeah. if the Giants had a chance to be in the playoffs and this was a then he needs to switch sides. Yeah. But, you know, I, th I think he's having fun with right. this. Right. Like, look, look, my jersey will mean something it. when this game means something. Right, right now, this is the toilet bowl, and y'all <laughs> ain't doing nothing. So, guess what? I wear what I want Your baby's wear. still playing for the Jets. That I is know. true. I Come felt on, the man. something right you said Giants, that. The Giants-Jets is one of the Damn. Super 6 matchups this week, Chance. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is. And congrats to the 105 winners of the Thursday Night Football Contest. Oh, wow. Damn. Who yesterday, I was put the jackpot. So, make sure you download the... 
Fox Sports Super 6 that play for mm. free. They get for $8. To win. $8 each. All three guys, LeVar, we're going to throw you in here. Okay. Giants, Jets, who you got? Give us a final score. Giants, Jets, who I'm going with the Giants. Gi- well, no, I just saw Daniel Jets. Jones. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm going with the Jets. <laughs> oh. Daniel Jones looked like trash. He did. He, mm. yeah. You know, he didn't look like trash. He played like trash. Right. I'm going with the Jets, Sam Darnold. Is that on our network? Uh, 10-3. This no, on our network? Oh, I don't know. 10-3. <laughs> yeah, it is on our network. 10-3. Mm. All right. Uh, you want to come back in and do another ten show three. instead of them playing Giants. that game? This, yeah. this is going to be 13-13 a tie. <laughs> it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to do this, but, man, y'all going to y'all gonna have to text me to score this Well, one. man, that's too much <laughs> motivation for Saquon. He burns daddy's jersey 24-20 G-Man, mm. man. All right. This Sunday, be sure to check out a live two-hour special episode of Fox NFL yeah. Sunday from West Point Military Academy. You'll get an exclusive chance to see behind the scenes and hear from U.S. Army cadets, plus a preview of the big games on Fox, including Packers, Panthers, and Rams Steelers. Trust us, you don't want to miss it. Sunday, 11 a.m. Eastern, only on Fox. Uncle Jimmy's here to help us talk about our approval ratings for John Gruden. But first, uh, you know, you. Oh. Big dummy of the day goes hey. where? Yes. Big dummy of the day go to the person that said, Johnny. I'm a huge Deion Sanders fan. <laughs> Bro, you're just huge. <laughs> got nothing to do with Dion. All right, let's talk John yeah. Gruden, who Insert got a big win name, last right? night any name. over the Chargers <laughs> and now has the Raiders back in the playoff hunt at 5-4. and four. Marcellus, do you think Gruden will ever bring the Lombardi trophy back to Oakland or yeah. back to the Raiders? Uh, back sorry. to the Raiders? No. Uh, I love the, the, the chapstick on the sideline, Coach. Got to get right, huh? Um, I, the Raiders have not won a Super Bowl since 83 and only made one since then. 14 different head coaches still in the AFC, which this year is loaded, and the Patriots exist in the AFC. Tough sledding, so I would bet no. Yeah, Patrick Mahomes is in the division. Makes it yeah. very tough sledding. Yeah. But I think they got a chance. I'm high on John Gruden. Yep. All right, Uncle Jimmy, what's your take on uh, Uncle Chucky or John Gruden? Chucky. Look, man, I, I, I'm a big fan of John Gruden. Oh. Because yeah. I, I like to be entertained. <laughs> now, now, last night, though, I thought I was watching the episode of the Universal Soul Circus. Come to find out I was watching a Raiders game. Yeah. Uh, what? Uh, what's that? Now, keep in mind, I'm not a Raiders fan. All right. But ain't the Raiders supposed to be mean, nasty, and entertaining? Yeah. yeah. I didn't get none of that on my TV last night. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you get? What'd you get? Look, man. Look, man, John Gruden was running up and down the sidelines Dressed like a lion tamer, like a lion tamer, but he ain't got no damn lions. <laughs> Vontez Burfitt gone. Yeah. Khalil Mack gone. Yeah. Antonio Brown gone. Hell, man, the Raiders ain't had no excitement since Antonio Brown got loosed in the front office and had white folks running around scared for their life. <laughs> now who the hell are you supposed to be afraid of? The little raccoon boy, Derek Carr? <laughs> <laughs> or, 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 or the pink baby rhino, Richie Incognito? <laughs> Look, man, this is bad news for the Raiders. <laughs> Look, man, the Raiders is about to go to Vegas. Yeah? Look, man, this little rinky-dink, chitlin' circuit, soul circus that y'all serving up right now, it ain't gonna play up in Vegas. 